This show is about ideas and provocations, as well as being hopefully a space to think about the future of your leadership. But how do you make sense of the world? In an increasingly uncertain environment, this is an important question that every leader should be asking themselves because it challenges us to question our assumptions and to seek new perspectives and sources of information. Perhaps most importantly, it should urge us to question our sense of certainty in how we see things. In this show, I talked to Scott and Emma about my decade-long project to rethink and understand how our brains and bodies interpret the world, which I write about in my new book, Leading in a Non-Linear World, Building Mindsets, for the future. Hey folks, welcome to a special edition of the Evolving Leader Podcast. I'm Scott Allender, co-host of the show, and today I'm delighted to be joined by a long-term friend of the show and frequent contributor, my friend, Emma Sinclair. Hi, Emma. How are you feeling today? Hi, Scott. Thank you very much for having me here. I am feeling, I'm feeling excited and intrigued about, uh, about our guest today, um, and I think you'll explain why, but uh, yeah, fascinated, feeling good and energized. Thanks. Good, good. Well, I'm feeling similar and uh, super excited to talk to our mutual friend. Uh, normally, he's co-host of the Evolving Leader podcast, but today he's moved over to the guest hot seat to be interviewed about his brilliant new book, Leading in a Non-Linear World. So, Mr. Gums, welcome to the Evolving Leader podcast. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's a bit weird being on the receiving end and good good education about how our guests might feel. So, thank you. Yeah. How do you feel? I feel a mixture of excitement and um, anticipation about the reception the book will get. Um, already getting you know some feedback. It's it was only uh, published about a week ago, so people are just getting their copies now, and one or two are coming back to me with some initial impressions, which are positive. So, um, but the, you know, the real test will be over time. Yeah, well, Emma and I are both honored to, to come in and interview you because I know she and I are um, huge fans of you personally, but but this book in particular, we've, we've each read it, of course, and it's, it's fantastic. So let's jump into it if we can. Um, let's start with a, a wide view and say, you know, why did you write this book? Um, well, I think I probably wanted to write it all the way through my career in, you know, and, and, and what I wanted to write has changed throughout that time, but the propelling force of that has been that I throughout my career have been involved in how to create and respond to change and if you look over the last 40 years the causes and ideas that we've used to make sense of this challenge have, have been pretty consistent you know they've been regulation disruptive technology and business models and the ideas that leaders and consultants and thinkers have been using have ranged from you know, kind of strategy like Porter's forces, organizational approaches, defining ever more minutely the kind of behaviors that winners adopt. Um, and of course, psychological-based thinking, again, trying to explain the experience of success. But for me, something was always missing in that equation. Um, part of it was it mm. wasn't joined up. And part of it, there was just something that didn't stack up when you taught people how to behave or how to think they didn't do it um, you know consistently so what what is it that's missing there so that that was the the real reason to um, to write it to explore that for myself and try and figure you know at least some part of that puzzle out so when you say your whole career John, I mean, just set that into context for us. How many how many years has this been <laughs> well, it, in it, the making? It, I, I suppose pre-career, when I started off uh, learning about the brain and neuroscience, um, it wasn't called neuroscience back in the early 80s because we didn't have brain scanners. That really didn't start until the 90s. But I did um, the, the kind of precursor to that with neurochemistry. So I'd always been interested in, in how our minds make sense of the world. And then as I started in the kind of mid 
80s. So we're talking, you know, 37 years ago. Um, so building layers of understanding how organizations worked and, you know, how psychology plays into that and so on is, is sort of like a, an archaeological dig of, of large-scale programs trying to figure out why they work, why they fail, and so on. So, yeah, 30-odd 30, 30 years of endeavor. So who's your book aimed at primarily? Well, I'm hoping that it'll appeal to a, a broad audience. I think Emma asked me when I started on this process that question, and, um, and I, I think the answer came really quickly to me, which is uh, these are things I wish I'd known when I was you know, start, in starting out my career. And so mm. I've dedicated the book to my two daughters, who I think would really benefit from it um, in terms of helping them to, to make sense of themselves and the world and to navigate it. But, you know, let's be honest, it's aimed at leaders primarily um, to bring about uh, a more human approach to leading organizations and you know, to managing and delivering change. Why now? Why, why is this an important space to understand what we'll get onto in terms of mindset? Well, it, it's the big context for this. I mean, the cliche of virtually every management book that you read and leadership and you know, ideas book in the business space that is that they all start with a phrase that you can trace right, right back to books like In Search of Excellence, you know, 35 years ago by Tom Peters. Um, the world is changing ever faster you know, um, and mm. faster than organizations can manage and so on. Um, and so that cliche of rising, the rising speed of, of change driven by technology disruption and so on, um, went into a completely new phase in the last decade. And, and some researchers at the International Monetary Fund have been looking at this and they've created something called the Uncertainty Index. And what they've done is they've really looked back since World War II at all the economic and political events and tried to trace the level of uncertainty in the world as it relates to, to those two, two factors. And of course, there's always uncertainty. I mean, you know, if you were in 1963 in the Bay of Pigs, you, you, life would have looked pretty uncertain. And I can remember, you know, at certain points in my career, in 2008 and going back further into you know some of the things that happened around the dot-com bubble bursting and so on the world looked very uncertain but those pale into into insignificance with the both the intensity and the relentless um periods of of, of uncertainty driven by things like uh the the trump presidency and brexit and covid and so on so the last 12 years this, certain, this um, uh, World Uncertainty Index says we are in unprecedented times. What that means ultimately, and why I've called the book um, nonlinear in the title, is that more of the problems that we face, it's really unhelpful to use the past um, as the complete benchmark for what we do in the future. Mm -hmm. The solutions will have a kind of nonlinear um, unfolding. And so if we can embrace a nonlinear approach to that, we meet complexity and uncertainty with complexity, then we stand a better chance of being able to solve those problems and adapt to the kind of outcomes that were inevitable. Can you pull that idea out a little bit more for us? Because it seems, you know, that I was always taught and, 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 a lot of approaches is how do we simplify things, right? How do we how do we come up with simplified answers to complex problems? But you're saying meet complexity with complexity. Mm. Tell us more about that. Well, I mean, there's the paradox of everything, which is you you need, as Einstein said, unless you understand something, convey it in simple terms, you don't understand it. Um, mm -hmm. So there's, there's definitely a uh, you know a need to keep digging and pursuing to get clarity around things, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it, it's simplistic. Um, you know, simple answers to complex problems result in short-term quick fixes that ultimately result in just more problems unfolding and unseen problems. So part of, part of what I'm talking about is that we have a huge set of interior resources that allow us to make sense of situations, but we're only drawing upon a 
a small amount of those things. And the way that the world is kind of directing us to become ever more short term and narrow in our focus means that we can't see what's going on. So ultimately, meeting complexity with complexity is, is the idea that when we draw on those resources, we can come up with a better understanding of root causes. We can see more of what's going on and we can embrace that, that, that complexity more comfortably rather than always seeking to come up with something simple. Sometimes we just need to let things play out uh, and go with them to a certain extent and influence them rather than fight them. I'm not saying that's always the case, obviously. Uh, and sometimes we need to, to make really radical and bold moves, but we can't see those uh, if we go for, for the silver bullets that try to solve things all the time. So these interior resources, which make up our mindsets, if I have it right, yeah? Yeah. Um, tell us more. Let's let's dive into that a little bit more. Can you give us some examples of the kinds of mindsets that you're talking about building? So let me let me go back a step and 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 talk about why I've used the word mindset because this word has escalated in use um, and it's become a cultural carrier of meaning for people, and often they don't know what it really means. Um, so if, if you look at the dictionary definition of the word mindset, it, it's 100 years old and it confers meaning around the attitudes and beliefs that we hold. And mm. I suppose the original definition was, was fairly pejorative in the sense that it's kind of fixed. In the last decade or so, the term has become exponentially used to mean all sorts of things from a kind of attitude towards life in general, a stereotype of a type of person or a group of people, social, political affiliations, all sorts of things. But you can boil it down into two main categories. The word is used to describe a personality type around uh, those beliefs, or uh, it's used to describe something outside of the person entirely, um, a kind of an idea or a framework of belief. So, you know, you can have a Brexit mindset or a, um, you know, a libertarian mindset. So what intrigued me about that, and, and I'm not going to dive into Carol Dweck's work on fixed and growth mindsets, was why is that word become so sticky? And I think what, what it boils down to is that it gives an indication of the interior. It, it, it points to how we see things. So I started to use that as a framework of, of investigation. And I, I spent, you know, best part of 10 years talking to people about the word mindset, what they meant by it, and talking to neuroscientists and experimental psychologists. And what emerged was a new definition for me, which is that our mindset is the most fundamental way in which we make sense of the world. And it's not just our brains, it's also our bodies. So it's the interplay between three things, how we feel physically and emotionally, how we make assumptions about the world. So our predicting brain is constantly running on assumptions about what's going to happen next. And then our perception, the way that we frame, the frames that we hold up to the world and what that allows us to see or to neglect to see or marginalize. Um, and those three things are constantly working together to allow us to navigate. And each of those systems, and there are many forms of them, are really governed by self-awareness, which are underpinned by mechanisms in the brain and body, all of which can be strengthened. So what got me excited was the idea that we can understand what mindsets are, we can build the underlying mechanisms, and then we can start to apply those mindsets to help us solve the big challenges in our life as the world becomes more difficult. So that, that's kind of the underlying thought process mm -hmm. that led me down this journey. I find that so interesting that you say, you know, everybody almost uses this word mindset regularly and um, definitely experience over last, you know, I'd say last couple of years, just perhaps 
perhaps being attuned to listening for that word maybe but it's uh, it's used obviously in performance uh, a lot in the sporting world which kind of makes sense that's sort of I put my mindset to my performance but you then start to hear other people saying well I just need to change my mindset about that or I'm, perhaps I need to adopt a different mindset and it is almost like them trying to find their way of understanding um, and what I like about what you're saying in terms of perhaps you know moving moving in a slightly different direction to Carol Dweck's work which suggests perhaps you might you, you either have it or you don't or it can evolve you know this interplay of feeling and thinking and seeing grounded in sort of own self-awareness feels like a um feels like something that's accessible potentially to everyone but self-awareness is is huge and some people either you know have done lots of work with that or haven't so you know you your model in your book starts to build this onion almost of self-awareness could can you just Mm. take us right back to the basics of how that yeah. started to form for you and, and what those layers are that we need to build. Well, I suppose the um, the starting point for me was if you think about yourself, um, your own mindset, imagine, imagine somebody else was describing you, Scott's mindset or Emma's mindset. Apart from anything else, you'd probably feel quite labelled and boxed in by that. But the truth is that you don't have just one mindset. You have multiple mindsets and you have mindsets for different situations with your family, with different teams. You can go to one team and be very playful and, you know, sort of joyful. Another team, you're very serious. And the mindset is formed by your previous experiences, the expectations that are placed upon you, how you're feeling physically, you know, all sorts of things. So our mindsets are, are constantly adapting. They're situational and they change over time. So that's one part of it. Then you, to answer your question about these layers of, of self-awareness or mindset, it all starts with a, a kind of a re-evaluation of how the brain and body work together. So in the past, the brain was seen more like a computer with modules that operated. And we've had a number of guests on our show, like Lisa Feldman Barrett and Mark Solms and, and so on, who have contributed to a new uh, so-called constructivist version of how the brain and body work together, which is the brain is constantly running on a principal mission to manage our metabolism. That's its core function, not to think, not to relate to other people, but to, but to move in the environment and manage um, our metabolism in order to survive. And when you think of it like that, what the brain is constantly trying to do is conserve energy. So it makes what are known as top-down predictions based on previous experience and, and what it imagines is required in this current situation. And that's constantly working with a flow of bottom-up sensory information, sight, taste, sound, um, you know, the, the, the signals that we get from within our body that tell us how our metabolism is, is, is doing. All of that interplay between top-down and bottom-up signals really gives us the propelling mechanism of, of our mindset. That's kind of like the foundation of how things work. So the, the piece that's most neglected in terms of self-awareness is the most important in many ways, which is, well, how's your body doing? What does your body tell you that's going on? And not that doesn't just give you a readout on your metabolism. It gives you a massive dose of information about what's happening in the world. And, and this started, this kind of set of insights started with researchers looking at somatic responses, bodily responses to decision making. So Antonio Damasio is a good example of this. He found that the body knows before the mind what's happening in the world. He gave people tests mm -hmm. to predict risk and uncertainty, uh, betting, gambling tests, where he'd give them decks of cards to, to try and make money over. And he'd measure brain responses and sweat responses in their uh, hands as they turned these cards over. And what he found was long before they intellectually or cognitively understood whether the card was going to make them money or not, their body knew quite a long time ahead. That started off a profound 
journey for scientists looking at this thing called effect, which is what our body feels, not our emotional responses, in relation to the world. And it's only just starting to unfold, but in fields as far ranging as decision making to helping uh, people with autism, what it's doing is it's showing is that when we tap into those signals, we can solve many of the problems that we currently face in a more demanding and uncertain world. So that's kind of like the foundation. And then th this constructive um, version of the brain shows then that our emotions are not illogical, irrational. They're just a different part of the spectrum of sense making and logic. And when we start to read our emotions, understand them and read them differently, not as the stuff that gets in the way of rationality, but as a different form of rationality by reading them, then that's the, that's the kind of next layer of, of awareness. And as we move up, starting to be able to challenge our, um, our assumptions on a continuous basis, which is really difficult because they, they form our, our sense of reality becomes the, the third dimension, and that's driven by something called metacognition. And another get, guest that we had, Steve Fleming, who's one of the world's leading experts on that, shows that the capacity for self-doubt is probably one of the most important advances that leaders, mankind needs in order to prevent this polarization that we're currently experiencing, to, to be able to know when we're right and when we're wrong in situations of uncertainty. So if you stack all of these layers of self-awareness, starting with the body, what that is, does is gives you a, a new interior compass to navigate the world, an incredibly powerful set of resources that all of us have. Nobody, nobody, um, uh, you know, it's not dependent on intelligence. This is a great thing. Mm -hmm. It's, these are all separate from IQ. Um, we all have access to them right from early childhood. So that's what makes me phenomenally excited about this. Yeah. Well, you and I have had, as you point out, conversations with many guests that have um, talked about various aspects of this, and we've had our own private conversations over the years. And, you know, what I always come back to is that we come, when we talk about self-awareness or we talk about mindset, you know, nobody thinks that they're not self-aware, mm -hmm. right? And nobody thinks that they're in the wrong mindset in the situation, right? So if something's going terribly wrong professionally or personally, there's some externalized reason for it, right? Separate from me, right? Mm. So, A, in your research, does it seem to come more naturally to some types of individuals to be more connected to what's going on in their body and in their feeling center and in their mind? And for those who aren't as aware, aren't as connected to it, how do they really start practically building these skills? Well, I think, you know, the first part of your question, which is, are some people more self-aware? And the answer is absolutely yes. I mean, we, we, we can see, you know, you can see our children. Some of them are deeply self-aware on lots of levels. They are aware of themselves. They're aware when they lie. Um, you know, mm. children are very good at separating, and adults are even better at it, separating lies, uh, you know, self-delusion. Um, but some children seem to recognize that from an early stage and be able to overcome it and deal in truth more, not naively, but more, you know, sort of in a more mature way. Um, but, you know, to your, to your you know, deep question about how do you increase it, I think the starting point is to recognize that we all think we're normal. It's this old, mm. old joke that, you know, somebody who's driving slower than you is an idiot and someone driving fast in you is a maniac. We always think we're normal. So, you mm -hmm. know, and, and the same thing applies in the political spectrum, in terms of fitness, all sorts of different things. We think we are the definition of normality. And even if we have counter information for that, we, we um, rationalize it away. So if you think about this onion, as Emma put it, of layers of self-awareness, when we break one of those layers, then that breaks the causal chain of meaning. So I, I ran an experiment myself to deepen the most profound layer, which is physical self-awareness, you know, so knowing what's going on in my body. And, and scientists label that interoception. 
the capacity to, to be able to read the signals. And in one of the conversations that we had with Lisa Feldman Barrett, she highlighted a really profound observation which inspired me to, to deepen into this, which was when you wake up in the morning and you have this brief moment of, kind of raw consciousness, as Anil Seth, another of our guests, talked about, the, the moment where it feels like something to be you. Not thoughts, mm. not identity, nothing. Just this raw sense that you exist, which is quite weird when you think about it, when you don't even know who you are. You don't know you're, you know, mm. you're living in a certain place, sleeping in a certain bed, or someone's next to you. You just don't know any of that at all, that few seconds. But what that does is it gives you an entry point to tap into the most fundamental sense of self. And so I use that as an experiment to do an old tradition called a body scan, which you see in many of the, the kind of uh, Eastern philosophies. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't thinking of it in any of that sense. I just wanted to use it to try and tap into what was happening with my body. And what that does is it helps you to create a separation between physical feeling and emotion, which we often conflate. And, and Lisa gave, gave the explanation like this, which is when you wake up in the morning and let's imagine you haven't slept well, you maybe drank too much or you didn't eat properly and you haven't done the exercise for a few days and you wake up and you feel under-resourced, you feel, as she put it, crappy, um, <laughs> then you step into the shower. You don't, you bypass a recognition that you feel like this. You step into the shower and you start thinking about the day ahead and the adrenaline surges and you feel awake and alive, but the day isn't good. The journey to work is going to be a pain. That meeting with Bob at 9.30 is just going to be really hard work. Then you've got that report. Which everything the day ahead is constantly looking you know, bad. And why is that? Because you don't have the resources. But you've made a disconnect between cause and effect. Conversely, you wake up in the morning feeling fully resourced, well, you know, slept well, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The day ahead, when you step into the shower and start thinking, looks like a series of opportunities and things that you're going to make progress on. It feels positive. So the point really here is that when you break that first link of awareness between physical resourcing and the emotions that you construct to make sense of your metabolism, your body in the environment, then you feel a sense of uh, resentfulness. And that sense of resentfulness over time turns into a feeling of loss of control, anger, you know, frustration, and that can play out in lots of different ways. And, and I noticed that in myself on the days when I didn't do what we're talking about here and just went straight from A to B. Conversely, when I did do it, even if I wasn't fully resourced, I didn't misinterpret it. And I was able to start reframing this and saying, well, yeah, you, you didn't sleep well. That's not the fault of Scott mm -hmm. when, you know, you come onto the call and he's very demanding about what he wants to talk about. You know, that's just me. It's my, <laughs> my, my issue. Um, so that. That's right. You remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. The, but the point here is that we start to evolve as a result of this. And, um, you know, that, that, that kind of becomes the foundation on which you can build the other layers of awareness. So I don't think, you know, having top down awareness is lasting because it constantly gets undermined by, by this feeling, um, of, of resentment. Um, so the higher levels of thinking, the things that you, want to do should do and so on constantly get you know sort of the legs chopped out from underneath them if you haven't owned or tuned into this primary form of, of self-recognition i'm really pleased you brought up the uh, the experiment because um I read this and um, noticed yeah. that you did this for 16 months, I think it was, over the pandemic. Um, felt like a very, reading it, felt like a very conscious decision to do this. Um, and what I like about that is because in this book, you obviously, you pull together so many threads of wonderful research that's out there, but this is kind of like your raw and you 
state that it's not scientific, <laughs> you know, um, but it's very much, you know, an experimental uh, approach to it. How did you do it? What did you actually do for 16 months? Bring that to life for us, for anyone out there thinking of doing it themselves. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm not necessarily suggesting anybody has to do it quite how I did it, because the the research that inspired me to do this was partially what, what Lisa was talking about, but other studies that showed by doing this kind of work, you increase the insular cortex, the part of your brain that's responsible for so many things associated with well-being and good decision-making and releasing resources under pressure. Um, and there's some fascinating uh, research that you know, if we get a chance to mention later on um, that inspired me around this. But what I actually did was, is really simple. I, I passionately believe, as you know, Emma and Scott, that any idea that you come up with has to be practical within the confines of our existing life. You have to meet people where they're at and, and give them things that they can do that work within the lives they have, not give them some idealistic strategy. So when you wake up in the morning, you don't just leap out of bed a nanosecond after you, you know you're awake. You lie there for a few moments. And in those few moments, and it might be, you know, 30 seconds, it might be 60 seconds, harnessing this moment of raw consciousness was the goal, really, just to tune in and do this thing called a body scan, which is basically turning your attention in this moment of sort of unimpeded consciousness. And there's nothing going on, not thinking about emails or, you know, whether the bin needs to be put out because I forgot it last night or any of that stuff. You know, it, it's literally you're there on your own and you can turn your attention inward and you start with your head the top of your head, move it to your eyes, to your throat, to your chest, to your stomach, and so on. And just linger there for a few moments and go, so what, what's going on? What am I feeling? And that gives you a readout of inflammation, heat, itchiness, tension, or, you know, just feeling relaxed and easy. And, and what that does is it strengthens the connection between all of those sensors that um, accumulate in the in the heart and then are fed by the vagus nerve into the the cortex, it gives your body a whole bunch of information that it can register. So that's what I did. And I did that every morning for, I think it was 441 days in total. Um, and there was a little brief moment. My father, unfortunately, passed away during COVID. And so it was a couple of weeks I didn't do it. And there are a couple of other... Um, days where I did but in general I did it the whole time and I also kept a close watch on exercise nutrition um, alcohol consumption and also emotional events that might trigger me um, and the kind of level of focus and concentration I had so I just kept a little it took me like three or four minutes every night just to rate each of those. I gave them a rating so they could measure it um, and plot it. And in the book, I show how there was just such a deep correlation between all of those things. And then the measure. And the measure was interoception. And there's a, there's a gold standard in, in neuroscientist um, adoption of this, which is that you measure your heart rate and you uh, using a, a monitor. Somebody else looks at that. And at the same time, you estimate yourself what you think it is. And it's the difference between those two things that gives you interoceptive accuracy. And what I noticed was that over the period of that time, my accuracy increased considerably, dramatically, in fact. Now, mm -hmm. that, that is correlated now with improved decision-making um, and a whole bunch of, um, of factors to do with well-being. What I experienced out of all of that was a fairly remarkable psychological change. I felt more interior space, more psychological freedom, more um, prediction of things that were going to happen. I felt myself being able to listen better to other people. And when I was triggered by some conflict or uncertainty, 
who perceives slight, <laughs> then my ability to separate my understanding of that, my reactions to it also massively increased. It made me much happier as a result. So for me, I, you know, the, the, the kind of science part of it is, is like home project. But for me, the impact was monumental. Scott, did you uh, did you recognise the difference over those? Uh, uh, yes, very much so. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering what the secret was as he just became much more grounded and present and centered <laughs> yeah. and aware. Um, but let's stay with this for a second because you know, before we move to the, to the emotion part of this conversation, I want to stay with the physical thing because everything you're saying is so important. Um, connecting to that physical feeling, understanding, and being able to you know understanding at least um, internal resources and, and how to manage those. But it's something that I think many, if not most leaders would want to bypass in favor of cognition and uh, maybe, maybe get to the emotional piece, but the physical piece feels like luxury. In fact, sometimes it seems like people almost brag about how depleted they are as almost as, as, as if it says, this is how hard I'm working. I don't ever sleep. I get three hours of sleep a night. Right. And they're almost boasting that this somehow makes them a more effective leader when it doesn't. Mm. And the opposite is likely true based on everything you're saying and all the other research that supports it. So for one of our listeners right now, that's, that's taking this in, you know, you, you gave some really practical body scan advice and the pulsometer what might you say to really encourage them adopting some of this or making a slight shift in how they, they approach their physical well-being? Well, I think it starts, all of this starts with establishing a why. So if you want to build a mindset, you know, the thing that you know, I would say to people who have probably tried habit-building strategies and so on and given up is that largely those things don't work. We've worked with over 60,000 people across the world um, in the last 15 years trying to uh, embrace that form of, of, of strategy. And it only works for about 15% of people on a sustainable basis. And the reason is that most of the things that we want to do in life are quite complex. They're not easily managed by simple um, re repetition of habits. That, you know, even going to the gym is many, many dozens of different separate habits, all of which can be derailed by how you feel emotionally or, or distracted by, by something else. So I think the starting point to acknowledge your physical capacity and the self-awareness around that is, is, is to see it as the foundation on which everything else rests. Hmm. Without that, you don't have a core. And, and, and I know that, uh, you know, what one... Um, leader said to me about the people that worked in, in this uh, law firm was that most of them, their awareness is from the neck up. The mm. rest of their, um, the rest of them is sort of just a means to an end. And mm -hmm. uh, Christopher Hitchens said something, you know, when, when he was about to die, which was, I don't have a body, I am a body. Mm. That recognition is so profound that your body is what makes sense of the world, not just your mind. So the next evolution of mankind is really to embrace that whole part of who we are. Not, not in some sort of Eastern tradition perspective, which you know is, has a lot of truth in it, but actually to start understanding the science of all of this, that we were designed to move, we were designed to manage our metabolisms primarily, and most of the functions in our body are, are to that end. Only a small percentage of them are for the higher orders. And when we embrace the whole part of ourselves, then we unlock just an enormous amount of resources to get the things that we actually care about happening, making better decisions, being more yeah. creative, being able to form and sustain great relationships with other people. So ultimately, we're running to the limits of what we can do with just pure cognition. And I think most leaders know that. They're running to the limits of what they can get out of their lives in terms of satisfaction um, off the job. And the level of complexity and demands facing them increasingly, I mean, you know, seeing this all the way through COVID is, just know it. 
it's not sustainable. So I think this is get, get your foundation straight and see it as part of your mm-hmm. strategy um, because it will serve you well. So can we build on that foundational piece and return to the emotions, right? So that with this bottom-up awareness, you framed it all up for us very nicely at the beginning, but now we've done a deep dive on the body. Can we do a little bit deeper dive on the emotional center? Yeah. So I think 2016, 2015, 2016, I started to really embrace understanding Lisa Feldman Barrett's work. And she had spent the last 20 previous years on debunking um, systematically the so-called classical view of emotions, you know, what they are, how they work. And, you know, let's be honest, most of our careers, that's the model, the classical model is the model that, you know, we used in terms of emotional intelligence, understanding and, and how people operate. And it's still based on this idea of uh, the modular computer brain where emotions are hardwired responses to external stimulus. And that the rightness of that idea was very hard to give up because particularly, for example, when you're triggered by, you know, a conflict or an insult and your body goes into fight or flight and the amygdala overreacts and da 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 and you act out. That, that seems right. It seems the experience. Mm-hmm. It seems to describe the experience. But what it misses is 20 years of evidence that that's not how it works. That we don't have dedicated parts of our brain for anger. The amygdala isn't just the fear central response. It's involved in all sorts of other things as well. And what Lisa and other researchers are showing is that we construct emotions to make sense of the world based on our metabolism, based on previous experience, and crucially based on the language we use to describe what we're feeling, what emotions are feeling. So when when we're, you know, we're scared and we see a snake coming out on the path in front of us, we construct the emotional response. The emotions don't happen first. The physical response, a heart rate uh, spikes, uh, adrenaline cortisol spike, and that then becomes the precursor to emotions. And we've got that back to front in the past. Mm -hmm. So when 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 we take this forward, it starts to unlock lots of really positive things. So the first thing it does is it says, when we understand our emotions differently, in this way, they provide us with additional information because emotions are information. They provide us with additional data on what's happening in the situations. That's really, really important when we're, when we're struggling to understand what's happening. And the data they provide us is that when we experience a negative emotion in this predicting brain model, what that's basically telling us is that some form of core human need is not being met. So that might be, you know, we're not resourced. You know, I'm feeling irritable because I'm not resourced. That's the obvious one. Um, you know, I'm hangry. Um, it may be that you don't value me in this situation. The core need is to feel valued by the people around us. Some might say that's our most fundamental core need. We have a need to understand what's happening. And so when I'm confused, I might get angry and judgmental at somebody else's lack of explanation, but actually, you know, the the emotion is telling me, no, I don't understand. I might feel excluded socially. I might feel that I don't believe or have a sense of purpose in all of this. All of these core needs to feel purpose, to feel involved, to feel clear, to feel valued, to feel resourced, When we read the emotions around those things, they provide us with a colossal shortcut to getting to the root cause of so many of the problems that face us. And the other part of this, which is, I think, really fascinating, is the role that language plays in in our emotions, which is that when you ask people how they're feeling, most people only give you four or five words to describe it. Their, Their emotional language is very small. And emotional granularity is the idea that when you start to become much more precise in what you're actually feeling, you realize that you're not feeling angry. 
You might be feeling shame or frustration, or, you know, guilt, all sorts of different things, which are much better, more accurate ways of understanding what's happening in a situation, how a core need is not being met. But if you've only got one word to describe a whole cluster of different reactions in social settings, then you're more likely to misread, overreact, um, and damage, you know, destroy value in, in relationships or miss opportunities. So what, what this new way of thinking about the world from an emotional perspective is it ultimately gives you more agency, more options, and it's really exciting. Hi, Phil Kirby here, producer of the Evolving Leader podcast. This is a very special episode, and it's not just because it's one of our two hosts, John, talking about his new book, Leading in a Non-Linear World, available from all good bookshops, but we also have a second reason to celebrate. This is our 100th episode of the podcast, and the reason we're still here is because of you, our listeners. The reaction from our first 100 episodes has been incredible. You seem to be enjoying it, our audience is growing, and we're having a ball. There's plenty more, so please stick with us. Share the podcast with your network and give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much. And now, let's get back into the conversation. I love everything you're saying. I'm sitting here nodding along with all of it. Um, and yet often, you talk about negative emotions. You're, what you're really saying isn't bad emotions. You're just saying uncomfortable emotions that are pointing to something, right? But oftentimes we externalize that to somebody else, right? We say, you make me feel such and such, Mm. right? As opposed to getting curious about why I'm feeling this way and then excavating the thought or the metabolism, the physical feeling, or maybe a belief that is sitting underneath that. What are some ways that people can get practically curious when they're in the middle of what is a very uncomfortable feeling that they probably want to push away as fast as possible because we don't want to sit in the uncomfortable feeling. Well, if you take two contexts here, so imagine, you know, you're having an an argument with somebody you really love and care for and you've committed to each other. So you, you often say and do the worst things in those because, you know, you're in it together kind of thing. And, Mm-hmm. Hopefully, <laughs> they're, they're going to tolerate some of that. Um, and you say things like, you're always wrong, or you, you, know, you make definitive statements. And when you've calmed down from that situation, you recognize that you, you're very sorry about that. But in the moment, you absolutely fundamentally believed you were right and they were wrong. So it's mm-hmm. just kind of that recognition. Now, that's really hard to uh, to avoid stepping into that but with greater understanding of what's actually happening to you 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 can start to anticipate and choose different paths so let's take the other context which is in the work environment where we tend to hold back um, from reacting to those things but we don't we either that reaction goes inward um, and you know, un- undermines our sense of um, well-being or judgment. In other ways, we pay it forward to the path of least resistance. So you know, instead of being angry with you know a colleague, we do it. We vent with a, a junior person and do damage there, or we we speak behind people's backs and so on, uh, and and create politics. So one strategy that's incredibly valuable is to recognize the physical response when we're triggered and Mm. just to stay with that. So I'll give you an example that happened to me um, earlier in the year and I wrote about it in the book because it was really quite unpleasant. So the one thing you can't can't avoid is the unpleasantness of negative emotions. But when you actually go, well, what are they telling me? It's really powerful, but you can't read them very easily when your body reactions are so strong. So in a, in a call with a client who shall go nameless, the CEO, after I made a fairly strident set of reflections and comments about a particular thing, on a, this is on a Zoom call, said, no, I don't agree. And I was massively triggered by this, thinking all sorts of, you know, catastrophizing of eventualities that everybody would think I was an idiot, that, you know, we were going to lose our 
relationship, et cetera, et cetera. And what I might have done in the past was to step into a reaction which, on the face of it, to me in the moment at least, would seem very logical, which is to defend, to, uh, to you know, with, with, with professionalism, to argue my case, to give some more examples, to try and rephrase it, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, to the fly on the wall, if I could watch myself in that moment, all would seem really defensive and perhaps even aggressive. What I did in that moment is I did nothing, which I find very hard. <laughs> Um, and I, I did, I took Lisa's advice and I deferred judgment. And what I did was instead was I just focused on what was happening, which was a metabolic overload. Heart rate was going, you know, high producing all of these neurotransmitters and hormones to prepare myself for a fight or flight response. And I just deferred judgment and let my body calm down, which it took a long time to do, but in the space of a few seconds, one of the CEO's colleagues went, no, I think that's a really important point. We haven't been talking about that. And I still didn't talk because that would have got me, you know, into more trouble. I let it play out and it played out really well. And the CEO at the end of the call said, thank you, John. That was a really great challenge. And it's got us thinking in a different direction. Now, hmm. how often do we defer judgment when our bodies are hmm. in hyperactive states. And I think that's the one thing that I've taken away from all of this, which is to learn how to, how to do that. And I think the, 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 true, the same is true for people who perhaps retreat in situations when they feel these things, when they, they go into flight mode. They need to do the opposite. They need to practice engaging and starting to talk in yeah. those moments so that they can they can ask great questions they have a repertoire of things to say and do in those moments that show that they are still in the game and they don't infuriate people by because they look like they're disinterested or don't agree or withdrawing support and judgment and people then question their value so you know i think it it, it comes down to something very simple which is really pay attention to what's going on in your body and it tells you something that you're not ready to use your brain cognitively in this moment, defer judgment. So the thing that um, I find really fascinating about this idea of feelings at the physical level and then emotions and how they're constructed and what I'm understanding by it is that it's almost uh, an access to mindset that potentially, to Scott's point, a lot of people have never really thought about before. So how have you taken that and built it into this this interconnection between thinking and seeing as well, which mm. might feel a little bit more concrete for some people. How do they yeah. interact together in, in your definition and world? So if, if you think of it like this, a frame, which is where we often start with leaders, for example, thinking about building mindsets within a team or within a culture, a frame is a mental model or an idea about the world. So that frame could be the customer, it could be innovation, or it could be growth, or it could be excellence, or it could be accountability. And what that frame does is it gives you a set of things that you're paying attention to in the world. Behaviors, data, events, relationships, and so on. It, it's, it's a set of ideas and things to observe. And what's associated with that are a series of assumptions that we make about things related to that. So we assume that the customer is important. We assume the customer wants this. We assume that we will do this to create value for the customer and so on. So the starting point here is to say, harness the kind of strategic thinking that leaders in organizations are responsible to and get them to recognize that often they're holding the wrong frames and sets of assumptions up to the challenges. They don't, they, they suffer from frame inflexibility. So getting them to recognize there are multiple frames and therefore mindsets they need to build and to be able to swap in and out, um, to be able to, uh, to think in more powerful, flexible ways. And then 
the bit that's always missing in these conversations, because some, some leaders are really good at this and some leadership teams are excellent at it. What they miss is that swapping frames and having the wrong frames for the wrong challenges results often in a lot of the conflict. You know, I'm holding an excellence frame, you're holding a customer frame. Uh, or you're holding a financialization frame and I'm holding a, a, a growth frame. And therefore, the assumptions that we're making in that situation are in conflict and making us feel triggered. And then the metabolic reactions uh, in the room start to rise and all of a sudden we can't think and we, we then start to become very judgmental and critical of one another. So getting teams to recognize this gives them a new language and a new awareness to be able to work together, to think together, to build collective mindsets. Because that's the next evolution in all of this, is how do you build collective mindsets where we can understand the world together? And the, mm. the, the piece that is really interesting around this is that when you get teams to feel together, to talk about how they're feeling, it unlocks... Um, both a human experience, so we can be human in this rather than, you know, sort of job titles, um, which is quite alienating and isolating. And then we can start to to find new meaning. Um, and that's where it's really exciting for me. And the collective mindset is the culture, right? Yeah. I mean, in, yeah, absolutely. You know, when, when you think about it, often culture is described as how we're taught to think about things. But I expand that and say culture is how we're taught to think, feel, and see. Because you definitely walk into a culture and you feel something. And that is absent in most descriptions of culture. So I wonder if we could perhaps move um, perhaps through to the, the second part of your book. So the, that first part is very much looking at the science that's underpinning mindset and how we build self-awareness at that individual level. And you mentioned in a previous conversation around how you build collective mindsets. And in the second half, you really describe what mindsets we can build for our future. Um, can you bring that to yeah. life a little bit? You've identified four, but um, you can pick your favorite if you want to. <laughs> well, I'll give you a quick, a quick overview of the four mindsets because um, it, it was difficult to choose these four over other ones that, that we have been experiencing uh, success with. But the, the starting one is really important, which we call more human. And this is the, the idea of radical self-awareness that we've been talking about to a certain degree that increases the flow of information starting from our body to our mind so that we, we create um, a mindset of well-being where the general conditions for healthier behaviors become more natural. Instead of having to use willpower and discipline or try to build habits, actually our bodies tell us when we need to sleep, when we need to rest, when we need to, what we need to eat, when we're full, and, and other needs for, for, for rest and renewal. And I have found that this approach has created a much more powerful um, shift in people because they become much more connected with what's going on inside them rather than trying to intellectualize and read the next thing to motivate them to, to do something. Actually, the information they need is coming from within. The next mindset is a big shift from away from that. And it kind of almost goes to the other end of the spectrum, which is, you know, one of the things that I've really been fascinated in in working with organizations is why do leadership teams struggle to focus on the future? And so th this mindset is called the future now mindset. And it's the ultimate strategic mindset. And it, it, it starts with recognizing that leaders have three forms of value creation responsibility, delivering short-term performance, aligning people and value and creating value for the future. And if you look at those three as kind of intersecting um, uh, cycles on a, on a Venn diagram, generally delivering short-term value is 95% of where they place their focus, which means they're creating an organization that's constantly going through um, a kind of roller coaster of being successful and then panicking 
because either products or, or, or marketing strategies aren't working. So creating a future now mindset is about trying to balance uh, um, those interests in a different way. And there's a whole bunch of fascinating research that shows how to think differently about the future and how to balance those interests. The third one is kind of allied to this, which is that in the last 20 years, there's been this rise of so-called exponential organizations capable of growing to a billion dollars of market capitalization, 10 times faster than a traditional corporate. And what they've all done is really build their business models, largely in digital, but through a test and learn experimental uh, playbook. Now, that, as that playbook has become more and more widely understood, organizations, traditionally kind of traditional ones, have tried to adopt it. They've all failed because there's a mindset that underpins it. The organizations that invented that and, and feel kind of comfortable with native uh, experimenters think very differently. And so what I wanted to do was decode what the mindset was that sits underneath that and then apply it. And I show a great example of work that we've done where at scale, um, we were able to take a very conventional organization, an industrial area organization, and within a very short period of time, be able to get them to do this 10x thing in a repeatable manner. And it's, you know, it's been a um, huge learning curve about how to do that. And then the final one um, that we talk about is a, a big idea, which is how do we create a more open mindset that's capable of seeing more of the value in other people, um, seeing more of what's happening in, in situations, and being able to create a more open culture within organizations where you see um, the, the value exchanges with customers more easily and across, or, across the organization. Um, because ultimately, that, that is going to be an absolute uh, necessity for more and more organizations to, if they're going to become flexible and adaptive to the constant change that they face. So that, that's a quick tour of the, the four mindsets. Fantastic. Well, John, my friend, thank you for being willing to sit in the hot seat and tell us about your book. Thank you. Yeah, it's a weird experience, but it's a good practice. So thank you. <laughs> how, how, well, how was it to be a guest? Was it, was it, how, give us, now give me a hosting rating now. You can tell us, tell us how it is to be a guest. <laughs> oh, I give, give you an Emma 9.8. <laughs> nice. Think, but how's your yeah. mindset, John? How are you feeling? Are you <laughs> depleted or are you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm pretty tired, yeah. actually, as a result of this, because it's like quite nerve-wracking doing this. <laughs> well, thank you. And, and uh, Emma, thank you for hosting with me today. That's been a lot of fun. Well, thank you very much, Scott. I could get used to this seat, yeah. Mr. Gomes. Well, uh, we'll have you back for sure. <laughs> and uh, make sure you pick up a copy of John's book, Leading in a Nonlinear World, today. And until next time, remember, the world is evolving. Are you? Are you?